Um, welcome all to the to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. Um, this week, uh, we are very lucky to be teaming up with uh, the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University uh, to discuss migration. How will the pandemic shift migration between China and Africa? Um, I'm just going to, before I hand over to um, the panel, I'm just going to, just a few sort of housekeeping announcements. Um, my name's Julian Richards. I'm the managing editor at Open Democracy. We want to involve this conversation to involve you as much as possible. Um, thank you to everybody who has uh, submitted questions, uh, comments ahead of time. We are going to address as many of those as we can. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can and you want to ask a question, you can click on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen and ask a question there. Again, uh, we'll try and get to those. Uh, people watching on Facebook uh, can also put their questions in the comments. Um, I have no more to say other than to hand over to um, uh, the chair of the panel, Oreva Lape. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration, and um, she'll introduce the rest of the panel. I hope you enjoy it. Over to you, Oreva. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, because I know there are people from different uh, time zones. My name is Oreva, and I'm very um, elated to meet you all. Uh, very, very pleased to be here as well. Uh, the webinar is part of a collaboration between the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Migration and Integration at Ryerson University and Open Democracy. Um, we have a joint blog called Pandemic Borders, which I um, encourage you to check for uh, cutting edge analysis about the impact of the pandemic on migrants globally. The link will be shared uh, with you in the chat. Um, and then uh, today we're going to be discussing how the pandemic will shift migration between China and, and Africa. And I'm very uh, pleased to have four, uh, four speakers with us today. Um, Shana Jin, uh, who is a doctoral researcher um, at the Center for Gender Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in the United Kingdom. Roberto Castillo, who is an assistant professor uh, of culture, uh, at the Cultural Studies Department at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. Um, Solange Chatelac, who is the research associate at Université Libre de Bruxelles. And Abdul Gafat Hubiyoshodi, who is a lecturer at the Department of Political Science at Lagos State University in Nigeria. Um, without further ado, I'd like to start with Ro Roberto. Um, during the height of, of the stringent uh, pandemic measures in China, um, international and local media, both uh, I mean, in China, across Africa, and all over the world carried stories and images of the treatment of Africans in China. What would you say was the impact of media representations um, at these different levels um, on Africans in China during the pandemic? Um, thank you very much, Oreva, for the question. Um, I think that I just, I would very briefly address your question because I really wanna open, have time to have an open discussion with everyone. Um, so this question is uh, related to the politics of media representation of African presence uh, in China, right? I say presence and I think I need to emphasize, emphasize that. I don't like to use the concept of uh, migrants or African migrants in China because of the heavy connotations associated with migration in the context of uh, North America or Europe, right? The types of mobility or human movement between China and Africa, uh, I have argued many times are different and, uh, and we could talk later about those differences. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I don't like to frame these as uh, the typical type of migration that we think about sometimes when we talk about the global North and the global South, right? So in that sense, I think that we need to sort of uh, change, uh, change the chip that we have in our brains to think about people that go from one country to another, right? I like to use more the notion of mobility or transnational mobility, but, but we can talk more about that later. Now, the, the, to be more specific with your question, the images that we saw uh, of what happened in uh, mid or early April 2020, specifically 
in the city of Guangzhou, which is the southern metropolis of China, the capital of Guangdong province, were definitely very strong images that were uh, that caused a, a massive outcry internationally, right? Um, so in many ways, when I was exposed to those images, that let's we need to say there were like maybe a few dozens of different videos that were presenting so many different black people, not only Africans, uh, being harassed, persecuted, evicted, forced out of their places of abode or houses. Uh, they were really, really uh, difficult to watch, right? However, although those images were very, very strong, and we're talking about media representation, right? However, those images were very, very strong. I would say that those images are not characteristic of the experiences of foreigners, black foreigners, or Africans uh, in the country historically, right? Now, we need to uh, highlight that what has been happening in the world in general over the last year has been something that we don't really know how to deal with. And um, the experiences of people of color, uh, to use a more North American friendly term, in the context of China are not that easy, but they are not as difficult as they are in other contexts uh, closer uh, to, 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 to you guys, right? So in a way, uh, although this, these images are not characteristic of the experiences of foreigners in China, and I need to emphasize that, they do connect with a history of perceptions of otherness and perceptions of blackness that we can very easily now prove uh, exist in China, right? Uh, and we could discuss uh, many uh, uh, racialization or racial practices or racist practices that we can find in social media, in everyday Chinese life, discourse, and so on and so forth. Now, to move quickly through your question, because I know other people also need to, to speak, um, and to address the, the third part of your question, uh, talking about the impact of media representation uh, kind of globally, right? How, how these images were taken by uh, media locally, uh, regionally, and perhaps also internationally, right? What we saw coming from uh, these forced evictions that were happening in Guangzhou in April 2020. Now, um, just to quickly highlight two ways, right? Uh, in, in, locally in China, because those images were also distributed in China, there were two reactions, right? There was the reaction of the people that were really offended in China, Chinese people, Chinese netizens, that were offended by this type of discrimination of foreigners. And they knew that this was gonna create a massive controversy. So they were, uh, they were kind of alarmed that this was happening because that was going to somehow damage the image of, uh, of China, right? The second other kind of uh, reading those images locally uh, in, the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese context was uh, presented by media, Chinese media locally as uh, this is not a case of racist uh, or racial discrimination. This is a case of dealing with foreigners that are not understanding the complexity of this situation and are not willing to abide by the rules of quarantine and so on and so forth. So they were kind of implying that Africans and Blacks in general in Guangzhou were unruly, right? And that was there in, in, in Chinese media, right? And they needed to be treated in, in that particular way. Now, we have to say that that way of treatment was received by anyone who was a Chinese citizen too, right? So in, in a way, uh, the Chinese government became quite tough in terms of the restrictions. Uh, and that's, that's what was happening in China. Now, the other way of kind of connecting these images with narratives about China internationally or globally was used by many Western media outlets as to, or, or also people commentators or people in social media or even scholars as to prove somehow that China is a society profoundly characterized by anti-Black racism. And that is a point that I, ha I have always found very contentious. I think that this is a point that we still need to explore. We cannot just very easily jump into that narrative of China being anti an anti-Black uh, anti uh, racism society, right? And the other narrative that was also around there is that those, those images were proof or evidence, like one more time, evidence of uh, the fact that China is a racist society. Now, when China internationally in global media, when China is casted or presented as a racist society, as a racist society, this in many ways seems to palliate 
certain anxieties in the West, right? As I see, it's not only us, they also do it. I know that could be controversial. We can discuss this a little bit later, but just to move a little bit uh, quickly to the last part of my question. Um, so in a way, this, this, this media were used by international media to, uh, these images were used by international media to represent China negatively, right? And can also be inserted in something that is quite fascinating. And I'm just gonna share my screen with you only for 10 seconds uh, to show you uh, a, Twitter, a tweet that I, uh, that I wrote today that you can see now on the screen. Uh, that's from my, from my Twitter. And I was saying, it is quite interesting to see all of Twitter talking about anti-Asian racism. This is from today, obviously and white supremacy in the USA in, in the context of the mass shootings uh, against Asian women. And at the same time that that's happening on social media, uh, having CNN going with the story of anti-Black racism in China as the story in its main website, which is a complexity, complexity, complexly, I don't even know if that's the word, sorry, ironic triangulation there, right? So uh, I was trying to highlight how these images of race and racial discrimination in China sometimes also get kind of connected to what is going on in the West and in particular, what is going on in the United States in very uh, interesting, interesting ways. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Uh, was I sharing my screen? Were you able to see my tweet? My tweet? Yes. Okay, yes. Good. good, thanks. And now I'm not sharing anymore. So the last bit is just uh, when we're, you were talking about the future, right? Like uh, what, what, what impact does media representation have on future of African migrants as well as you know, African relations generally? This is a very broad question that I will address in, in one or two lines. Uh, talking about the future in this day and age of uncertainty is quite difficult, right? However, I think that we cannot expect a very hopeful future in terms of mobility and migration, at least on the Chinese side, right, of this pattern of migration between Africa and China, right, for the types of regulations and the systems of control and surveillance that the Chinese state has now in place and that will develop eventually to control illegal or, in, I don't like the, the, the word illegal, but to control informal forms of mobility. And this is to say that many of the Africans who have stayed in China for the last 20 years, many of them have remained in the country informally not illegally, but informally. And those informal mobilities will be highly uh, surveilled in the context of artificial intelligence and apps and all these digital medium that could somehow uh, control um, uh, the movement between China and Africa. So I don't wanna talk more. I just wanna stop there and uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Roberto. Um, uh, some of the points you raised are very uh, crucial um, in this discussion, uh, particularly um, try, trying to keep in mind that there are differences between the experiences in the global north and within the global south as well. So we need to keep that in mind whenever we talk about um, the, the um, things that are happening um, in, uh, between Africa and China specifically. Um, and also the, 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 the point um, about um, watching how uh, uh, in the global north, um, watching for uh, points to try and connect the racism between the global north and, 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 and China's um, responses to, to black people as well. Um, those are areas that uh, we will definitely be uh, going into uh, deeper detail um, in the conversation. Um, with this, I'd like to turn to Xianlang. Um, during the, the uh, pandemic, um, a lot of countries imposed very strict uh, uh, prevention measures, um, and these so, uh, a lot of these measures marginalized um, uh, uh, people um, of uh, foreigners. Um, for example, Africans in China. Um, in your blog, you, you said that the this discriminatory responses to Africans must be understood in the complex Chinese political context. So, what would you say is this context? or the root of this um, the uh, heavy handed approach towards um, Africans or black people in China. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, and thank you for coming, everybody. I really appreciate it. 
Um, me, uh, I was born and raised in China. I'm now studying in the UK as a, as a PhD student at uh, SOAS, uh, which is also now having a huge discussion about anti-Blackness. Our director used uh, the N-word uh, in, uh, in a previous meeting with uh, our students. And now this is a huge discussion uh, in the UK. Um, and I really appreciate, uh, so today I'm really uh, not speaking from an expertise perspective, uh, but I do really appreciate Oliva still uh, sent me the invite to, to, to write the blog and uh, have my voice out. So here I'm really speaking uh, from the perspective as a Chinese feminist activist and Chinese feminist scholar here, uh, just uh, sharing with you about uh, as a Chinese woman, how I respond to anti-Blackness racism in, in China here. So in the blog, um, I'm very aware of my time, my five minutes. In the blog, I, I actually wrote about two episodes uh, of anti-Blackness racism uh, only uh, in 2020, the only one year. So in February, we had the first episode was that in February 2020, we had an online consultation from the government seeking for like popular opinions about uh, migration, new migration laws in China, right? And that received a lot of criticisms and protests online from our Weibo uh, netizens. And one of the uh, one of the hashtag became really, really trendy. And that hashtag was called Chinese boys would protect Chinese girls. Uh, that was really, really inter, uh, uh, irritating for me as a Chinese woman living uh, under all these years of patriarchal structure in China, because I personally myself was involved in the Me Too movement. There was no Chinese boy involved in the Me Too movement to protect any of us to start with. Uh, so that after the first episodes, you would not be uh, but in the first episode of this um, uh, Chinese boys will protect Chinese girls, you will see, uh, uh, so who are they protecting the Chinese girls from, right? So uh, this targets a population would be migrants, particularly those from Africa or black communities in China, right? And then, uh, so you will not be surprised in April, this uh, draconian uh, measures taken by the Guangzhou government targeted at black diasporas uh, during the pandemic. And that was a vivid evidence of anti-Blackness racism in China. And I don't think uh, uh, maybe I could have a more like lengthy discussion with Roberto and many other panelists later on about the denial of racism or how to frame racism in China. But I, I would argue, and I argued in the blog that anti-Blackness in China is attributed to conservative nationalism and toxic masculinity. The interlocked patriarchal and a nationalist Chinese women as private property should be limited to a certain Chinese race and undermine foreign immigrants, especially black male diaspora uh, as a sexualized and thus menacing race. So adding to what Roberto just mentioned about the mass shooting of uh, Asian women in Atlanta uh, happened a few days ago, uh, that was also horrific. I think there is a definitely a gender component in this anti-race, uh, anti-blackness racism uh, happening across the world. And we might wonder uh, in the media representation about those homeless black diasporas in Guangzhou, what is their gender? And in this mass shooting of Asian people in Atlanta, what is their gender? And why there are certain genders portrayed in certain ways as certain victims, as certain uh, enemies, as certain cr criminals even, uh, as bad immigrants even, right? So uh, I'll stop here and I would like to have more discussion uh, with you about gender, nationalism uh, and immigrants or migration. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Um, your thoughts on the, on the factor shaping uh, discriminatory pandemic prevention measures. Um, is particularly important because it sheds light on the gendered aspect of Sino-African um, exchanges, which is, uh, is an aspect that I um, believe still needs to be uh, explored more. Um, and you, in your blog, you point to the role of masculinity in shaping nationalistic responses towards Africans in China and how it impacts people to people relations at the local level. So uh, I think those are very, very important points and I, I look forward to um, further um, exploring the, those points that you made. Um, with this, I'd like to uh, turn to Solange. 
Um, in recent decades, the population of Chinese people in Zambia has steadily increased, um, referencing a UN world population study from 2019, there were about 80,000 people living in Zambia. And the, this increase um, of Chinese people in Zambia has impacted um, both Zambians and Chinese people, politically, socially, and economically. Um, what would you say were the experiences of Chinese people in Zambia during the pandemic? What do you think the factors, what factors were shaping those experiences? Uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, for, for, for holding this event. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, thanks also for your question, but I, can I um, answer the first question, which uh, we, you know, we were given and kind of like, you know, shaped my, my answer, which was essentially how will the pandemic shift migration between China and Africa. So I want to start with kind of like the top question. And I, there are two parts really to, to this question, in my opinion. One is what, the, what will happen in the short term and what will happen in the long term. So um, as Areva uh, signaled, so my, I focus essentially on sort of Chinese uh, presence in Africa and specifically on Zambia. So I can't really speak for the rest of the continent. It's a huge continent with a lot of diversity, but most of my field work and my data comes from Zambia, so I can only speak really um, coming from, from that background. Um, in the short term, what I see is definitely a slowing down of migration, or at least my mobilities, if you like mobilities or human movement between the two sides. Uh, it's worth pointing out that mo movements is really coming from China, essentially. So as, as Oriva pointed out, you know, we have numbers of, you know, increasing numbers of Chinese uh, going into Zambia. But China, according to this 2019 report uh, spearheaded by the UN, the International Migration Organization and the Zambian government, China does not feature in the top 10 destinations for Zambian migrants. So Zambians, when they migrate, they or when they go out, they tend to stay regionally. So they go next door to Zimbabwe, uh, Tanzania, South Africa, Malawi, much more regional. And when there's more long-term, more long-distance migration, they tend to go to Britain, America, Canada, Australia, countries where there's sort of some sort of historical or personal linguistic affinity. So China is definitely not kind of a top destination. I'm not saying that uh, Zambia is a top destination for the people who are there. You know, if you speak to a lot of the Chinese migrants living in Zambia, Zambia was not their top destination, but because of, you know, life and, and circumstances and particular opportunity, um, they ended up there. So first of all, there's a lot more kind of movement coming in from China than going to China from Zambia. That movement will significantly slow down in the short term, but it certainly will not stop. And it won't stop because I've witnessed it. I have uh, contacts on the ground and I have friends who work and who broker, if you like, uh, relations between the two. And I spoke to one of these brokers recently who confirmed that she's still sending, you know, groups, delegations of Chinese to Zambia uh, nonstop. Um, and, you know, it, when they're questioned, are you afraid of going there because of COVID? And most of them are not. Um, I think they're more afraid of the everyday pressures of living, survival of living in China under, you know, intense economic and political and social pressure. Um, and they'd rather, you know, still take their chances in Zambia. One, one of the reasons, you know, there are obviously different groups that are still moving to Zambia today. Some are people who have already vested interests, so they have companies or they have business interests, investments, or they have family there, so they need to go back to Zambia. And others are prospective investors and others are workers. So there's a huge diversity in a whole range of different motivations um, of people who are there. Um, but to be honest, that's really a testimony um, to the opportunities that are taking place on the continent, really. And I think that's kind of the hidden, a lot of people, there's a lot of talk about agency and African agency. And, you know, rather than trying to find one individual, I rather see it as a process. I think that's a testimony to the massive uh, dynamism of, Afri of industrialization all across the African continent, which, you know, generates these mutually exp you know, expanding needs for labor, for capital, uh, for foreign technology, et cetera. So I think that's kind of like the hidden um, agent really that no one uh, seems to be talking about. But in the long, so as I said, so I see migration being slowed down considerably uh, because of all the obvious logistical security, safety reasons, health reasons, but I don't think it's stopped. Um, and then in the long term, um, I, I don't see Chinese, um, you know, migration stopping. So now we have to be very careful. I see there is a couple of questions coming up on the on the board. I think it's really worth mentioning to this audience. I don't really know who we have amongst us, 
But when we're talking about China, there are really different dimensions to the China equation. Okay, so we have a very real, uh, you know, political China. We have the PRC, and the PRC has very specific geopolitical, long-term strategic interests. Um, and part of that, of course, is is to, you know, part of the China Africa story is, or, or rather, the China Africa story is part of a bigger story, which is the rise or the re-emergence of China as a major player on the global scene. So I don't see any slowing down there. China has global ambitions and it will kind of pursue whatever it can you know, to, to, to achieve its, its global ambitions. Then you have, of course, the story of Chinese capital, which is money. Um, and that capital can be state-backed capital, like state-backed finance, but it can also be you know, private capital. Um, and capital is kind of you know, global. It has no real nationality. And I don't see Chinese or cap, let's say capital coming in from China slowing down anywhere because capital just seeks constant you know profit to make profit and then you have another dimension which is the social dimension and the people um and again you know i'm part of the you know i i prefer the, the long durée school of, of of studying and if you you know looking at migration looking at chinese migration to africa or to southern europe or to central america for me if you put it within the much longer history of chinese migration across the world i mean it's just kind of um, grown and you know it's not a linear process it's a historical process it's been irregular it's, it's con you know Chinese migration is, has been and still is predominantly strong in Southeast Asia so you know migration to Africa is very 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 marginal compared to the number of Chinese who migrate within Southeast Asia 75 percent of Chinese migrants stay within the Asian region Asia Pacific and then um, a big big chunk go to North America and Europe and a much smaller chunk goes to places like Africa and South America and Australasia, although numbers across the board are, are kind of growing. So if you would speak you know, to, to Chinese people now and say, well, you know, will these numbers change? Um, you know, there's one word in China, which is zhang, which means grow up, you know? So I think in the long term, the numbers will keep going up. They might go up, you know, regularly with suspended moments like now because of due to COVID. But I think in the long term, uh, migration will resume. Um, but again, we have to, you know, break down how does this migration relate to the capital, move, the movement of capital, and how does this migration relate to the state and the state's ambition? And those are very different things. They overlap, they're entangled, but they're, they are different. And I don't know how much time I have to go into that, but I think I will um, leave it at that just to give you kind of a bigger picture. Uh, thank you, Solange, um, uh, for really going into that aspect of Sino-African exchanges, which is um, it's more uh, the area that is more discussed is about Africans uh, coming to China. But there's there's a, a lot of um, economic um, activities on, that are ongoing um, on the continent itself, and and um, Chinese people are. Uh, also um, moving um, to different African countries and having um, uh, some insight into the impact of, of those exchanges is very important. Um, finally, I'd like to turn to Abdul Ghaffar. Um, prior to 1950s, China's relationship with Africa was focused on decolonial struggles, uh, but this shifted primarily um, uh, to business, trade, and development post 1950s. And because of this, there was a shift um, to uh, an increase in person to person exchanges uh, between both sides. Uh, what are some of the ways uh, the pandemic has impacted? Um, migration exchanges between China and Africa. Well, thank you, uh, Rabo, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm joining the meeting a little bit late. There was this, you know, I left Nigeria for Ghana, so that really destabilized my, you know, understanding of the timing. So, but to join Solange, I think we need to clarify or we need to emphasize the point that you know, there's, there's no Africa, you know, Africa is complex, you know, Africa is not a country. So when we discuss what will be the impact of the pandemic on Africa, it's, it's you know, it, 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 an easy example was when Chinese go, I mean, doctors during COVID were going into African countries, many of the African countries were actually welcoming them. But in Nigeria, it was a different ball game. People were protesting. It was a little bit embarrassing. So the contexts are quite different. The implications, of course, would also be di different. But before COVID, China has been a fundamental partner to Africa. You know, from the airports, 
railway roads, construction, development finance. China is a key player. Now, but going to immigration, I mean, migration. The pandemic has reemphasized certain existing, you know, views of China on the continent. And I'll be starting with racism. Racism was by far the most, you know, uh, I, 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 you know, racism was by far the key element of most Africans' understanding of China. The picture that were coming in that was that was being circulated on social media were generating so many, you know, grievances online in newspapers and the rest of it. So that's had implication for how government responded. And one of the responses has implication for migration. During the pandemic, you started seeing, I'll be citing most of my examples from Nigeria. You saw in Nigerian government parliament raising questions about Chinese living in Nigeria, saying that they need to begin to investigate and send back some of the Chinese you know, to, to China to get their papers before they can be, be allowed. So asking what the implication of the pandemic will be on China, two things. One, the issue of racism that I've talked about. Then two, going forward, how the media crafts Chinese presence on the continent. And that was, uh, you know, the point I was trying to make, make in the blog that I sent to the open democracy that the media actually helps us to, on, I mean, to frame China's presence on the continent. So Africans post COVID may actually see China as a partner in progress in terms of the construction, which is already going on. You know, Chinese construction firms have started going back to the project. It is almost as if we are living in the post pandemic, you know, world construction project, the railways, the road constructions are going on. But of course, there is the issue of the race that I talked about. The media is also, you know, ready to showcase future racist, you know, expressions. For instance, when, the China, when China had the New Year's celebration, it was reported in Africa, and that had implication for how Africans actually visualize the Chinese partners, Chinese friends. So going forward, I think the media has a fundamental role to play in how the post-pandemic Africa-China migration will look like. Whether my China is presented as a location that Africans can go to. Of course, China is also, you know, you know, China is also conscious about that fact. And before the pandemic, it was estimated that to 2021, China will be welcoming African students more than the combined you know, African students in the Western world. But with the COVID, you know, the, the, the maltreatment of Africans and the pictures that came out, it's, it's, it, 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 you know, it's up to China to determine how it manages that. And of course, in managing that, the media is also central. Is also central. Maybe I should stop and probably wait for the questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Abdul Ghaffar. Um, your focus on the interplay of local realities, the media and racism, which in your piece you termed as the three elephants in the room, um, uh, particularly issues like the, 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 the televising of blackface in Ch uh, Chinese New Year celebrations. Um, is very, um, very crucial in, in this discussion because um, as um, uh, Roberto talked about the, the, the implication of media representation in, in per, um, people's perception of, of um, the other is, is, is shaping um, uh, um, our, uh, the things that we're, that we're seeing. Um, uh, after this first round of questions, I will now turn to the questions that were submitted ahead of time by the audience. Um, this is a question for um, uh, Abdul Ghaffar and for Roberto, and it's focusing on the use of the term migrant to, de to describe um, Africans in China. Um, both of you have said um, in your work 
um, about not using that term particularly because it connotes some other conceptualization that does not necessarily um, depict what is happening between China and Africa. So can both of you, uh, whoever wants to uh, uh, address the question, um, explain that um, line of thought? Um, do you want to go for that, Abdul? No, Roberto, you can start. I'm just then quickly going to address this question in the way in which I address it with my students uh, in here in Hong Kong. I normally tell everyone that um, this is based on experience, based on the research that I've done, based on the people that I've spoken to, based on so many different interviews with people uh, living in uh, China from many of the countries that you could name in, in, in Africa that are sending people somehow uh, from Africa to China. And I think that one of the things that I normally tell them is that, uh, as I said a little bit in the beginning, right, we need to remove that chip, especially in North American context or Euro, Euro Atlantic context in a way, right? Uh, it is very different when we're talking about migration and migrants in particular, when you think about Africans in China, uh, and the Africans that come to China normally, uh, and I would say overwhelmingly are individuals that take, I don't know, take a plane in Lagos and uh, uh, go to Addis Ababa and then switch planes and get to Hong Kong, Guangzhou, historically speaking, right? Many of them, especially when they're young, they're individuals that don't come with a lot of resources, but they're, most of them are somehow educated middle classes with certain, certain capital, if not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, money, right? Uh, but, but some of them do bring money and so on and so forth. And, and the distinction that I always make to my students is that it is very different to take a plane in, in, in I don't know, in, in Lagos to Addis and then another plane uh, in Ethiopian Airlines to Guangzhou and get out of the airport, take a taxi, than to walk for three days in the Texan this desert, crossing the border, jumping a border, crossing it for three or four days with two liters of water, pulling your children with you, or to getting on, uh, getting on a small boat in, I don't know, in Libya or in Egypt or in Morocco or whatever in North Africa uh, to risk your life to cross to the other side, right? So we're talking about different types of individuals on the move. And that is what I think that is normally reduced when we talk about migration from the global south to the global north. Uh, whatever, I don't know exactly where China lies. I would say China's global south, but sometimes people say China's becoming global north. But anyway, in that sense, I think there's a very big distinction. There's so many different types of mobility, so many different types of migrations. There's a very dis big distinction be between the ways in which in Europe and North America, people think about people risking their lives to get to a place to look for a better future. And then you get these people coming from African middle classes in many cases to test their luck in, in, in China, right? And uh, well, that, that is one of the distinctions why I don't like to talk about migrants in that sense. Uh, thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Roberto. Um, this is a question for uh, Abdul Ghaffar. When you're talking about uh, media, you are referring to, are you referring to local, Western or Chinese media or all of them? Um, how would you describe their respective influence or reception? This is from um, Bing Xinjiang in the chat. Oh, thank you for the question. I think when I used media, I used it broadly speaking, you know, and of course, when we say media, the, the, the difference between the traditional and the new media is actually, you know, being erased. Take, for example, you know, the maltreatment of Africans in Guangzhou. First, we started seeing it on Twitter. Before you know what was happening, the same video that was posted on Twitter were being posted on the TV, the online, you know, website of television stations, of newspaper sta newspapers. So th that division is really not there. So when I used media, I used it in terms of uh, the collective of the traditional, the social, the, the new, uh, the, the traditional, the TV, radio, newspapers as well as the social media the new media so i used it broadly speaking oh, thank you abdul Ghaffar. um there's a question for shannon uh, uh the question is uh, there were very negative reactions and anti-black sentiments from chinese netizens um to china's permanent residence reforms on platforms like weibo um did these um, reactions and protests from chinese netizens have any impact 
if there, if there was an impact, what was this impact? Well, the short term, thanks for the question. The short term uh, impact was that the government decided to uh, postpone the implementation for uh, this uh, permanent living uh, per living uh, residence permit for foreigners in China, right? But so far we need to admit to the fact that only 1% of foreigners living in China have that permit actually, the residence permit to live in China. That's quite limited already. Uh, but then because of the online protest uh, from, from Weibo, uh, so the government had to uh, postpone the implementation or any uh, further uh, actions upon that uh, uh, sort of uh, opening that space for, for more foreigners to reside in China. Thank you, Shenna. Um, this question is for Solange. Um, um, someone asked, what um, is the background of Chinese people in Zambia and how did Zambia become an attractive destination for Chinese people? I think, my, I think the, the answer really um, resonates with uh, or, or bounces off what uh, Roberto was saying in terms of the different profile of migration. I think migration generally uh, around the world um, has evolved significantly. You know, we're not talking about, um, you know, people leaving, um, you know, rural backgrounds to move into cities. I think the profile of, 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 of migrants, if you like, or people who move, people on the move has changed considerably. And that is definitely what we have seen um, what with, with new Chinese migrants. So new Chinese migrants essentially refer to people who have moved away from continental China, mainland China, uh, rather than Hong Kong, China, you know, Hong Kong or Taiwan or Macau, uh, since the reform, since opening and reform, so since the 80s. Um, I mean, I'd, we obviously don't have time to go into the history of Chinese migration, but um, as I said earlier, you know, most of the migration or the mobility used to happen in Southeast Asia, then it moved to North America, then Europe, and now it's kind of trickling and moving to new frontiers like in Africa, etc. So what you're seeing is uh, the profile is extremely diverse. You know, I think um, you will be surprised uh, at the, the kind of people that you will see. You have uh, laborers, for example, like the kind of typical stereotype stereotypical image you have in your mind of the, the person coming over and, and, you know, doing manual labor with very little maybe, you know, um, social and economic capital behind them. Though you have incredibly sophisticated people, people with PhDs, uh, people with master degrees, educated people who, um, you know, are, are in other fields. They cons people are mainly in the services, trade and services, and then they go into manufacturing. Um, you have to understand that, you know, uh, integration or, you know, investing or integrating in local society requires, you know, access, it requires capital, it requires, so people, you know, think they, the Chinese are there and then they, you know, they jump in to grab uh, Africa's national, you know, natural resources. So let's take mining, for example, Zambia is, um, you know, one of the largest copper, um, you know, offers, has largest copper resources, the second largest copper resources on the continent. Uh, it's very hard to get into mining. This is a very capital intensive, long-term uh, sector. The only people who can really enter mining, you know, are people with deep pockets. And, you know, these are big multinational companies or in China's case, you know, the government. And even the government has to pull money from different ministries, different government agencies. You know, there's no one group that, you know, looks after mining, if you like. Um, and everyone else, you know, as I said, works in different sectors from agriculture, you know, manufacturing, wholesale, retail, a lot of the services. Um, let me give you kind of, you know, one example. When the, you know, financial crisis hit um, in 2008, um, this had a direct impact, of course, on, on, on commodity prices. And so, you know, Zamb a lot of Zambia's uh, national income comes a lot from its exports of coppers and copper prices came crashing down and business was slow all around for everyone and I and I and I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, sells jewelry and I said you know she, you know they're diamond you know they sell diamond you know diamonds and you know gold rings and uh, all locally sourced and locally designed and then sold internationally and I just said you know so how's your business going etc cetera, etc cetera. and she said well my business is booming um, you know I've got you know much slower business locally but I'm getting these planes of Chinese jet set jet set people you know like really high-end investors um, coming in, you know, uh, with their kind of, you know, black platinum or, you know, American Express waving this around and literally kind of like buying up lots of stuff. And she said, you know, and, and I'm like, well, you know, how, who are these people? Are these kind of like 
old men and she's like we've got everything i saw you know you know ceos of companies down to kind of like you know very young uh, beautiful daughters of probably you know rich people etc so it was just very interesting to see that there's you know a lot, i mean this was a slightly different because these people you know it was very clear they were coming in for a, a quick kind of like field inspection you know like an investment inspection going around the country and then they were kind of moving in to other countries to have a kind of a look and one of their stops one of their pit stops was with this this particular kind of jewelry um company but the, the the snapshot is that we're seeing a really really diverse range we're also seeing a lot of women because often when we speak of uh, you know people on the move we tend to think of men who are labor migrants but actually there's a lot of women and the number of women are in, is increasing in fact that's from my time there and the data that i collected women uh, particularly of a certain age between let's say 18 19 to 45 that was kind of like the fastest growing cohort demographically of numbers of, of people coming in and I was really impressed at kind of how those numbers have snowballed. And again, you know, if you've got more women going over to a country, that obviously means that they're, you know, that the, maybe the first phase, the pioneering phase of, of my, you know, mobility migration has kind of like fizzled out and we're entering a more kind of like sedentary or at least a stabilization of certain activities, et cetera. Um, you know, as I said, because there is money to be made. I mean, people would not be going there. But again, I think we need to we spoke about you know what are their profiles but what we, we probably what is valuable to understand is the social conditions or the context in which they make these migration decisions and essentially and, and i think this is kind of often overlooked is that surviving living in china today in today's context is very very hard you know china is rich now um salaries are on the up you know some people are saying if china is so rich why are these people leaving china and essentially because life as an ordinary kind of what we call lao bai xing as you know an ordinary man on the street man or woman on the street life is really hard it's just really hard to survive it's really hard to support your family it's really hard to put your kids through school and it's really hard to look after your children and your aging parents and because of the whole set of demographic financial economic social political pressures that are increasing people are just looking for something else. You know, they're not actually even looking to make money. That's another problem we have with the migration kind of lens is often that we think it's just about capital accumulation. It's just about making money. It's just about, you know, the American dream and making it rich. Actually, it's not. A lot of the times it's about lifestyle. A lot of the times it's just about aspiration. A lot of the times it's just about get me the hell out of here. And uh, I just need to see something different. And if that means I have to roam around, you know, Africa, if that means I have to go to, you know, Argentina, Brazil, and do a couple of loops or around the world to end up somewhere, I will. So I think there has to be consideration for there's, there's a much, there's a, there's a strong diversity in profiles. There's a strong diversity in motivation and kind of saying that we're just going out there to make money um, would be quite a, a narrow and a, a limiting view. Um, thanks, Solange. And uh, this is a final question for all the, the panelists. Um, and whoever feels comfortable with, with uh, answering it can go ahead. Um, what is the lesson that can be taken from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic experience into future pandemics um, in the exchanges between China and Africa? Take it seriously. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I feel sorry for my Tanzanian brothers and sisters, but I'm sorry that, you know, for the loss of your president. But I think it's a very, very important lesson. You know, we lost President Magufuli, who is, has a PhD in chemistry and maths and who wanted to fix COVID through prayers. That's problematic, that we have a problem there. And I was just looking at the maths and I, we've lost almost 15 African heads of states in the last 15 years whilst they were in office. That's problematic. These numbers are really important. So, you know, for me, if COVID has done anything, it's to say, take your public health seriously, take science seriously. Um, uh, does anyone else want to uh, address that um, question? I think that I would just like to make a, a very different comment, but also kind of related to, uh, especially um, to the crisis that we saw developing in Guangzhou in 2020 in relation to COVID and Africans in China. I think that very often, and this kind of relates a little bit to Zambia, right? Somehow I'm going to try to make a connection here. Very often uh, for us people who do research about Africa-China relations or China-Africa relations, we very often and very easily, I would say, talk about uh, anti-Black racism, right? And often in the African context, this is in the Chinese context, right? And often in the African context, you hear these words anti-Chinese sentiment, right? Or anti-Asian sentiment. 
And uh, today, earlier today, I was um, in the context of what happened in Atlanta, I was uh, reading so many different tweets and one of the tweets was saying, why do we keep saying anti-black racism? This is a, this is a black African-American person who said, why, why do we keep saying anti-black racism and we don't say anti-Asian racism? Why do we call it sentiment, right? And I know this is, for some, it may seem to be only a choice of words, but in many ways, especially in the Africa-China context, we still tend to theorize what happens in Africa against Chinese, and there are things happening all the time, as a sentiment, as something that, that it doesn't really account to racism because somehow, and this is a complex discussion, right? Because somehow racism against Chinese is not African, it comes from somewhere else. So I'm trying to be a little bit uh, controversial there. But again, I think we need to start talking about anti-Black racism and anti-Chinese or anti-Asian racism as well. And quickly, and in, in 10 seconds, for that in the Chinese in Africa and Africans in China Research Network, we have by the end of this month on the 26th of March, a seminar or a, web, a webinar like this in which we're gonna be discussing the title of the, of the, of the, uh, of the seminar is uh, on anti-black and anti-Chinese sentiments to try to, you know, to uh, bring the discussion into what are we talking about and why do we talk about sentiments in one case and racism in the other, which obviously connects to Zambia because Zambia is one of those places where people have been talking and discussing anti-Chinese sentiments. Um, Wendy, I, I think, can I? Yes, quickly, I think for me, if we are going to learn anything from the pandemic, you know, is that China as a country needs to be more serious with the issue of racism. If you can't have a big, you know, event on the national television talking about blackface, if you can't have the mistake of having you know, a drama that talks about the independence of Taiwan on the national TV set. Why will you now bring a whole, you know, you know, a whole race and now depict, depict them in a particular way? So for me, if we are going to learn anything from the pandemic, the relationship between China and Nigeria, I mean, Africa is very strong. But racism increasingly is the major dent in that relationship. So China should not deceive itself that it's, you know, it is just a victim of anti-Asian, you know, I don't know whether I should use sentiment or racism, you know, based on what Roberto just talked about. But if China is a victim itself in the UK, Australia, you know, and, you, you know, US, the same country should not be a perpetrator of the same thing that it is a victim. You can't be a victim and a perpetrator at the same time. So the Chinese government must become serious about the question of racism. Um, thank you, Abdul Ghaffar. Um, and with this, I'd like to thank all our speakers um, for this uh, very interesting and dynamic discussion. Um, we, we were, um, were limited by time, so we have to kind of um, bring it to a close now. Um, I would also like to thank the audience uh, for their questions sent um, earlier on and also in the chat. Um, I hope that this webinar has been able to shed some light on the impact of the pandemic um, on Sino-African migration exchange. I mean, I mean, there's not enough time to address everything, uh, but um, I, I hope that we've been able to touch on um, some of the most important I think, points. I think Sianan, Sianan is asking for a last word. Oh, yes. Sorry, Oliva, I just really want to jump in uh, to echo with what Ab uh, Abdu was saying, that the denial of racism or what Sir Roberto was saying about sentiment doesn't really help nobody. And I want to say that all kinds of racism is crime. And there is no such a thing called sentiment or feeling or hatred. All kinds of racism is a crime. And we are now actually studying a campaign in the UK among Chinese international students. Uh, I just sent it on the chat so you can pop into that Instagram and saying where handle is our handle is Chinese Against Racist Virus. We're now organizing a campaign uh, against uh, uh, anti-Asian racism in the UK and asking for British universities to take actions to protect and facilitate Asian protect, students protect. In, in British, uh, in British universities. Uh, universities. universities. I can hear universities. myself, sorry. I can hear myself, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Um, I'd like to conclude this uh, webinar by giving back the floor to Julian. Uh, because we're really um, pushing the, the time now. 
Okay, thank you, Oreva. Thank you, all the panel. That was a, a great discussion. I think you covered, and also the discussion in the chat, I think was also really good. Um, so thanks everybody for, for participating in that. Um, <clears throat> we have a weekly debate on open democracy. Uh, you can uh, check our website and social media to, for the details, or you can visit the page where we normally post them, uh, which I'm just putting in the chat now. Um, we also have a weekly newsletter at Open Democracy, um, which goes out every Saturday. Um, you can sign up for that, which I hope or you may have done so already. And finally, um, Open Democracy, to put on events like this, we rely on contributions and donations. If you want to see more uh, public interest journalism and um, academic and journalistic partnerships like this, please support us. You can support us at support.opendemocracy net slash donate as I've just put in the panel. Um, thank you very much again for coming and I hope to see as many as you as possible next week. Bye.